It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And this question is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, today the Ontario Medical Association confirmed what we all suspected, that this government has no plan to address the primary care shortage. In fact, if they keep it up, they're on track to make the crisis in health care worse. Family doctors are concerned that this government, and I want to quote them here, Speaker, quote, further uh, that this government will further erode the ability of family doctors in Ontario to build viable practices and continue to put access to family medicine out of reach for a growing number of Ontarians. Further, Speaker, we know that the number of physicians uh, that are retiring far exceeds the number of graduates uh, into family practice. So the people of Ontario want to know, does the Premier agree that a strong recruitment and retention plan is necessary to care for the more than 2.3 million Ontarians who do not have a family doctor. And to apply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, I'm going to use this opportunity to do a bit of compare and contrast, shall we? So I look at what the NDP government did under Bob Ray. They actually cut the number of nurses and residency positions. Under the Liberal government, we cut, they cut. 50 residency positions available for family physicians, for physicians looking to match a residency. What does that mean? That means today we have over 300 less physicians practicing in the province of Ontario. Now, let's compare that to what we have done since 2018. Since 2018, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have seen a historic high of 12,500 physicians licensed yeah. to practice in the province of Ontario, here, here. a historic high. We are ensuring, through last month's matching of residency positions, those are young people, those are, John, those are medical students Fine. who are matching with their residency uh, specialty of choice, 100 per cent match in the province of Ontario. You, and of course, what, we've actually increased. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. 2.3 million Ontarians Order. without a family physician in the Order. province of Ontario under this government's watch. While the government and while this government is ignoring the crisis in primary care, we are seeing private for-profit clinics popping up all over this, prov this province. They're promising 24/7 access to primary care, but the catch is patients have to pay hundreds, even thousands of dollars. This is all about money, making money off of very sick people, Speaker, and it is shameful. There is something very seriously wrong with that. The government is doing nothing to stop these so-called executive health clinics uh, from gouging patients. So my question to the Premier is, is this government eroding the public health care system to help line the pockets of private clinic operators? Members, please take their seats. Minister, Minister of Speaker, we have more to share in terms of expanding our health care publicly funded system in the province of Ontario. I'm not sure if the member opposite remembers that in February we announced an expansion of 78 primary care multidisciplinary teams. Since February, we have already seen in Minto Mapleton, in Innisfil, in Kingston, that these primary care multidisciplinary teams have recruited and started taking on new patients. Those are patients who are being attached to primary care practitioners in the province of Ontario, 78 that we announced in February. And of course, under the leadership of the Minister of Finance, we have made an additional investment of over $500 million in our most recent budget. Order. We're getting the job done. And the final supplementary. Speaker, the family doctor shortage has had ripple effects across this entire province and the whole health care system. With fewer family doctors, patients are spending longer in waiting rooms, uh, in emergency rooms, in walk-in clinics. Many of them are foregoing preventative care, screening, altogether. Physicians have been warning successive Liberal and Conservative governments for years about the consequences of not investing in Order. primary care. So, Speaker, back to the Order. Premier of this province. Why is this government ignoring the solutions that are being proposed by family doctors? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Health. 
We're taking a system-wide approach to ensure that we have capacity. We, are, we have 50 hospital capital builds that are in the pipeline right now today. New hospitals, ex expanded hospitals, renovated hospitals. We have two new medical schools that are starting in the province of Ontario. The Northern Ontario School of Medicine today has 51 per cent of their students wanting and matched for a primary care practitioner. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the scope of practice changes that we are making to ensure that people see the right clinician when, when they are looking for assistance, we know that those changes, specifically with pharmacies, have led to a decrease in people going to emergency departments because they have access at their local community pharmacy. We will continue to do that work and Response. make sure that can, Ontario continues to lead the Canadian Federation in the number of physicians who are matched with patients. Stop the clock, please. Once again, I need to remind the House that it has long been the established practice of this House that members should not use props, signage, or accessories that are intended to express a political message or are likely to cause disorder. This also extends to members' attire where logos, symbols, slogans, and other political messaging are not permitted unless the House has granted unanimous consent. This legislature is a forum for debate, and the expectation in the chamber is that political statements should be made during debate rather than through the use of props or symbols. I'm going to ask the member for Toronto St. Paul's to come to order. I'm going to warn the member for Toronto St. Paul's. I must name the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Jill Andrew, you must leave the chamber for the duration of the day. We can resume question period. Once again, I recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Back to the Premier. Uh, Global News has just reported on the chaos and confusion that surrounded the Premier's reckless decision to restructure and dissolve Peel Region. And then his, of course, we'll all remember this, partial reversal, another giant flip-flop just months later. Billions of dollars in taxpayer costs were at stake, and the Premier either didn't care or had no clue. It seems like neither the transition board nor anyone in the ministry had any idea where the Premier was going with his plans for Peel. So when it comes to restructuring of Peel, does this government have any idea what they're doing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> a supplementary question. Well, I, I, you know, Speaker, I, I don't expect that, that minister to have to continue to answer for this, but um, the chaos and the confusion doesn't end. The people of Peel have real problems that need to be addressed by this government. Brampton Civic, one of the busiest emergency rooms in the country, continues to operate over capacity because Peel Memorial is not funded to operate 24-7. The Premier could implement an NDP solution right now to hire more staff for that hospital, but he refuses to do so. So is the government solving problems for the people of Peel or just insiders and land-hungry developers? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's 
talk about Brampton, Let's Mr. Speaker, Brampton. and what this Premier and this government have done for that city. In fact, Mr. Speaker, it's that same leader who lost three of her own MPPs oh, because no. of the neglect that they have shown to cities like Brampton. Let's talk about the 413. Here, here. Your, your, uh, as your position on that is to oppose it while the entire city and region needs it. When it comes down to investing in new hospitals for Brampton, what did you do? You voted against that. When it comes down to opening one of the new, the, Order. A new medical school, the first one in the GTA in over 100 years, what did the NDP do? They opposed that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Oh we will continue to invest in Brampton, Mr. Calling. Speaker. And I hope the NDP get out of their downtown bubble, Order. come to the streets of Brampton, Mississauga, Peel region, and listen to the people and what they're saying. They want us to build roads, highways, transit. And that is exactly what we will do. Order. Order. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, this government can keep making all those hollow promises and hollow claims, but the people of Peel, I can tell you, see right through it. They're spending more time in bumper to bumper side traffic order. on the 401 order. than they're spending time with their kids at home. The Premier could implement an NDP solution right now. Remove the Highway 407 tolls for truckers, but they Take your seat. The government side, please come to order so I can hear the member who's got the floor and is asking the question. Okay. Order. Order. The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, uh, you know, let's talk about Peel. Peel doesn't want the NDP to represent them because Peel voted in all PC members to represent the Peel region. Why? Because the Liberals, supported by the NDP for decades, neglected the region of Peel. One hospital didn't rebuild the second hospital, but what is happening? We are building the second hospital in the region of Peel. We are making a highway to get people home faster so that they can spend time with their families. That is happening because of under the leadership of Premier Ford and this government. So yes, we will continue to represent the people of Peel because we actually listen to the people of Peel and we will continue to get the job done for the people of Peel. Okay, stop the clock. I made a mistake, and I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Okay, start the clock. The next question. The member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. My question is to the Minister Resources. There, has been, there have been over 14 fire, wildfires recorded in Ontario already in 2024. This is in comparison to two, wild, uh, two fires recorded at the same period last year. According to wildfire fighters, we are still short 200 forest fire fighters. Minister, what is your plan to fill the gap? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if the uh, member opposite wants to talk about statistics, the number of hectares is way down over a 10-year average already this year. But, Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear. I've been very clear in this house about the respect and support we have for our wildland fire rangers in Ontario. And we have our crews ready to go. We have our aircraft ready to go. We have the people on the ground doing the logistics ready to go. In fact, we're ready to help not only Ontarians but other jurisdictions all throughout this great country of ours should they be suffering during their forest fire seasons. Mr. Speaker, we have always made it a priority to look after the well-being of communities, infrastructure, individuals all throughout Ontario. That's what our wildland firefighters do. We've got the crews on the ground again in the air and are ready to go when the time calls for it. Supplementary question. Well, Minister, I think your cuts in the budget will reflect my next question. Minister, the ministry is not only short-staffed, they are also missing three water bombers out of six to, be properly cut, to properly cover the fires. Let's not mention the other planes that are not ready. In the words of Noah Friedman, 
pro uh, provincial fire crew leader, if you don't have enough, you have to decide what burns and what doesn't. Minister, how will you decide which community will be will will the water bombers go first? Members, please take their seats. Natural resources and All our equipment's ready to go. All our people are ready to go. I just visited the base in Thunder Bay ten years ago. Order. Ten, ten days ago. Order. Ten days ago, Mr. Speaker, went in and talked with all those fire rangers, the people that are doing the logistics, the pilots. They're ready to go. Absolutely ready to go. So to insinuate otherwise is doing a disservice to Ontarians, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker. We've got our attack bases all throughout the north. Again, ready to go ready to go to make sure that Ontarians stay safe. That's the mission of this government. That's always been the mission of this government. You know, previous governments did not make the investments that we make today to make sure that we're supporting our firefighters, to make sure that we're doing the things that want to bring people into forest firefighting in Ontario. But the, the conclusion, Mr. Speaker, of Response. all this is that this government is the only government that is making sure that Northern Ontario stays safe, grows, and has opportunities. Thank you. The next question, the member for Whitby. So thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The Liberal carbon tax continues to not only increase our energy and gas bills, but also drive up the cost of food, housing, and so much more. That's why speakers should be given that all members in this legislature oppose this tax. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Order. Rather than join our government in calling for the federal Liberals to scrap this disastrous tax, the NDP and independent Liberals are choosing to play politics and ignore their constituents. Our government stands with the families and people of Ontario, which is why we will not stop until the federal government finally listens and eliminates the carbon tax. Speaker, could the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to support our Question. clean energy future without resorting to the carbon tax? Thank you. The Minister of Energy. Speaker, the member opposite knows exactly what we're doing because he's a huge champion of the investments that we're making in our nuclear sector. Coming from the Durham region, Canada's clean energy capital, Mr. Speaker, the refurbishments that are going on at places like Darlington and soon will be going on at the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, also the new development of small modular reactors. Mr. Speaker, we know we don't need a punitive carbon tax in Canada or in Ontario. It's simply not working. But the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the king of the carbon tax, Justin Trudeau, are continuing to make people pay more. They're making them pay more on their home heating bills. They're making them pay more on their gasoline uh, fuel ups. They're making them pay more on their groceries. My parliamentary assistant and I were even saying this morning the Queen's Park Media Gallery Spring Fling next week has even doubled in price, up to $80 next week, Mr. Speaker. Now, I don't know if we can blame Bonnie Crombie and Justin Trudeau for that, but it's 80 bucks this year, Mr. Speaker. Response. So we're, we're, we can do this without increasing the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Member for Beaches East York, come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister of Energy. We hear it time and time again. The Liberal carbon tax only stands to punish Ontarians. As people in our province continue to struggle with high interest rates and rising cost of living, all governments should be putting forward measures that provide financial relief for individuals and families. Instead, the federal Liberals, supported by their provincial counterparts, are choosing to drive up the prices of day-to-day -day essentials like gas in the tank and groceries. Speaker, Ontarians have had enough. It's time to scrap the tax. Could the minister please explain to the House why the federal government must end this unjust carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the great member from Whitby again for his question. Obviously, 
the carbon tax is having an impact Order. on everything in our province. And I continue to get heckled by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie's crew over here, uh, the Liberal Party of Ontario, who continues to support Justin Trudeau's Order. federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. There's no bones about it. It's costing everybody more to live in our province, and the carbon tax is driving that, not just in Ontario, but right across the country. But our plan is working here in Ontario. Our energy plan is called Powering Ontario's Growth, investing in new and refurbishing our nuclear reactors, investing in multi-billion dollar refurbishments of our hydroelectric facilities, building the country's largest energy storage in a competitive process, other non-emitting renewables that are coming onto the grid, Mr. Speaker, in the future that are going to continue to ensure Response. that we are the economic powerhouse in North America, landing deals like the $15 billion Honda deal. The member for Beaches East York will come to order. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, speaker, this government is deliberately and chronically underfunding education in Ontario, and children are paying the price. This year's budget included no meaningful increase in base funding to address the complex needs of students in Ontario, particularly the funding for special education. In Ontario, it was a drop in the bucket and does not even cover the deficit of most school boards. Last year, the TDSB spent $67.6 million more on special education than what they received. Kids are hurting. Teachers are struggling. It has never been this bad in Ontario before. My question is to the Minister of Education. Why is this Conservative government so adamant about underfunding the education sector, which is at a crisis point? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Speaker, for the question, for the opportunity to speak today about an investment we have made to improve public education. I'm proud that our government has increased funding for special education by $659 million when compared to the former Liberal. That is the highest investment, $3.5 billion, ever recorded in Ontario history. Now, we've also increased funding to $29 billion overall for education. We've increased this staffing by 9,000 more education workers, 3,000 more teachers. But let's listen to what the student had to say on the front page of the Waterloo Record just a few days ago. Kian Merze, a 16-year-old youth mental health advocate, said, and I quote, I think that the Ontario government is doing the right thing, backed by the right data, when it comes to the imposition of restrictions on cell phones, the banning of vaping, and the removal of social media from school devices. Common sense back in the classroom. Join us as we restore focus and discipline in Ontario schools. Order. Supplementary question back to the member for Waterloo. Minister of Education, that cameras do not replace educators. That's what's needed in our system. Uh, <laughs> Recently, a constituent of mine who works at a local elementary school in Waterloo Region as a child and youth worker said violence in schools is at a crisis point. She detailed the abuse she faced at her school, and it was shocking. Being injured or degraded on the job, being spit at, having scissors thrown at them, being punched, kicked, pinched. On top of this, there is a lack of support to cover sick or injured staff. The Conservatives' government's significant underfunding of the education system means that EAs and support staff shows the lack of respect they have for these workers. They weren't even mentioned at all in this latest budget. To the minister, when will the Conservative government give the education sector and education workers the funding they desperately need and the respect that they deserve? Mr. Of Education. Mr. Speaker, we understand how important it is to make sure our schools are safe and places of academic achievement. It's why we've invested a 577 percent increase in mental health since we started in 2017-18. We just added funding, Speaker, $15 million more to leverage community-based mental health supports in partnership with the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, because we have a plan to restore focus in the classroom and safety and common sense by restricting cell phones, banning vaping, and removing social media from school devices. And I would hope members opposite, parents and legislatures would stand with the government as we impl implement this plan to finally establish academic rigor back in Ontario schools. We've added more staffing, we added more funding, and we're asking Order. for higher expectations on our school boards to deliver safety and academic achievement and excellence back in Ontario schools. 
Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacocca. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. <laughs> We've heard it from Ontarians, from premiers of all political straits, and from experts that the Liberal carbon tax needs to be scrapped. But the federal government is not listening. Instead, they lit, hiked the carbon tax by another 23 per cent last month. While we listen to the heckling from across the floor, Order. further emphasizing that they're completely out of touch with reality, Speaker, the impacts of this disastrous tax are felt in communities across our province, including in the north, where the cost of transporting goods is already higher. Now they are being penalized with higher gas prices. That's simply unacceptable. The federal Liberals need to scrap this tax today. Speaker, can the minister further share with the House how the Liberal carbon tax negatively impacts Northern and Indigenous communities? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. It's, it's one thing for us to say it here in this place. It's another thing to hear it from municipal and First Nations leaders from across Northern Ontario, which is precisely what happened at the Northern Ontario Municipal Association uh, meetings just uh, about 10 days ago, and of course, uh, Phnom yesterday. All we heard, Mr. Speaker, was the costs associated with the carbon tax on just about every aspect of a municipality's operation, and for isolated and remote First Nations communities, that additional cost on their fuel. Now, Mr. Speaker, despite the Prime Minister's inculcations that this is good environmental policy, Mr. Speaker, there's an overwhelming number of people who are opposed to it. So when the uh, leader of the provincial uh, Liberals took the throne, you would have thought that she would have said no to the carbon tax. In fact, she did precisely the opposite. It's what makes her the queen of the carbon tax. Response. Everybody in Northern Ontario says they're out of touch. It's too expensive in Northern That's Ontario. Right. Scrap the tax. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians are feeling the impact of the carbon tax on everything from their groceries, their gas, their heating bills, and so much more. It is driving up costs and making life unaffordable for individuals and families in Northern Ontario and across the province. But, Speaker, the opposition members representing these communities remain silent as the federal government hikes this tax time and time again. The people of Northern Ontario deserve better. While the NDP and independent, independent Liberals continue to downplay the impact of this regressive tax on Northern communities, our government is fighting to ensure their voices are being heard. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what communities and businesses Order. across the North are telling him as to why they want an end to the Liberal carbon tax? <laughs> Mr. Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, just getting back from Sudbury, I met a, a couple of folks, part of the Renewable Resource Recovery Company. These are an extraordinary group of entrepreneurs and inventors, and they've paired up with the Coniston Seniors Housing Complex. And they've been able to uh, develop a geothermal type technology that draws the heat off of sewage pipes. It heats at least one heat pump, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the seniors complex. If they get five more heat pumps, they'll be able to power, heat and cool the entire first floor of this multi-story building. Fantastic technology. It's attracting PhD students from top universities, Mr. Speaker. My only question is, wh why don't they wrap those sewage pipes coming out of the Prime Minister's office and understand what everybody really thinks of this tax, Mr. Speaker, and that is to scrap it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. May is Community Living Month. In Ontario, we have over 100,000 people with intellectual disabilities accessing developmental services. Over 11,000 people have added their name to Five to Survive campaign online. Their ask is 5%. 5% base funding to keep the lights on, accessible vehicles running, and qualified staff during a human right resource crisis. Premier, will you commit today to provide the 5% that community living is asking for? Members, please take their seats. Reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. Good morning, Speaker, and thanks so much uh, for the question. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm very appreciative of the Premier and our government, of our partners who are doing great work, community livings across the province here, Mr. Speaker, which is why we back them up with support. Mr. Speaker, we are investing more than $3.4 billion on developmental services this year. 
That, Mr. Speaker, is over a billion dollars more than the previous government was doing. Now, why do I mention that, Mr. Speaker? It's because the NDP held the balance of power for three years, Mr. Speaker. You've been here long enough to know what you can do when you hold the balance of power. They could have forced the Liberals to invest more in amazing partners who are doing great work across our province. Order. They didn't. They failed the people of this province. It took this Premier, it took this caucus to stand up Order. for people on developmental disability across Response. the province and say, we will have your back, just as we have since we formed government. Mr. Order. Supplementary question. That's awfully rich coming from a minister who's been in government for six years. Here, here. We have heard we have heard about group homes in Ottawa, Toronto, Hamilton, Order. Windsor, and more that have had to close their doors. 14,000 people are sitting on wait lists, and 80% of those same organizations are expecting a deficit this year. Aging parents need to know that their now adult loved ones will be in safe, supportive Order. housing with consistent staff. Their ask, their plea was for 5%. Your government gave them 2%. Premier, when will you take responsibility for the, the absolute crisis you are creating and properly fund our supportive housing living homes? Members of please take their seats. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The member for Ottawa South come to order. The member, the member for Waterloo come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. Throw about the 5% you're giving them today, okay? Order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services can reply. Mr. Speaker, I wish this member and her party had shown the same passion when the previous government failed the families across the province, other than talk. There must be cameras running, Mr. Speaker. There must be cameras, because when the cameras are off, Mr. Speaker, you will never see the NDP. In fact, I will tell you what they have done. They have voted against every single measure that we have put forward to make sure that the service providers have the tools and resources to serve the people of this Ontario. This member has been here long enough. But of course, when the cameras are running, you'll hear the NDP get up and talk a big game, Mr. Speaker. Order. The member for Hamilton Mountain is warned. Order. 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 The minister can wind up his response. Mr. Speaker, in the last in the budget 2024, I am proud and thankful to the Premier and the Minister of Finance for increasing the support to our partners who are doing amazing work. There's still more work to be done, Mr. Speaker. I assured our partners we will never stop standing up for them, who are doing great work across every response. single community in our province. The, they failed them. They failed. The member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, come to order. The member for Windsor West, come to order. The, the member for Essex, come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough. Gilbert. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, I met with seniors from my community of Scarborough Guildwood to discuss their concerns. Living on a fixed income means that every day they are falling further and further behind in this affordability crisis. They are concerned about what the future looks like for their grandchildren and future generations, whether their grandchildren will ever be able to afford a home. They are concerned about having to use their credit card instead of 
and OHIP card to access the health care they need. At a time when Ontario families are struggling to pay bills, the Premier is more concerned with helping wealthy, well-connected insiders. My question to the Premier, when will the government stop putting themselves and their wealthy friends first and focus on making life more affordable for families in Ontario? The Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that acknowledgement. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for that question. You know, and I'm, I'm sure as we go to vote for the budget, the member opposite will dutifully consider supporting what's in the budget, which includes the guaranteed annual income system, which is indexed to inflation for the first time ever for low income seniors. And I'm sure the learned member opposite will also take a look at that. We cut the gas tax yep. for many people who have to move around this province, Mr. Speaker. And my colleague over here <laughs> with the one fare for those taking transit, saving daily riders $1,600 a year, Mr. Speaker. This is real money for the people of Ontario. And I'll have more to say in the supplements. Tell us about the carbon tax. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it is clear from that answer that this government is more focused on wealthy insiders and not the people who are struggling to make ends meet. Member will take your seat for a minute. Take your seat. Take your seat. Take your seat, please. The government side will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Scarborough Guildwood has the floor. I apologize. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, groceries has never been more expensive. It is impossible for our young people to even dream of buying a home, and our hospitals are overcrowded. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. Sorry. The member will take her seat. I had to stop the clock. Look, at, I can't hear the member who has the floor and is asking a question. The government side will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Instead, this government is focused on an $8.3 billion backroom deal with the Greenbelt and selling out service Ontario to American corporations. This government does a great job at taking care of their friends and wealthy insiders, but when it comes to working families, they could hardly care less. Premier, are you going to keep letting the affordability and housing crisis spiral out of control, or are you going to put a stop to the conservative gravy train once and for all? The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Yes. The Minister of Finance. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm sure the member opposite has read and will, co will consider budget. voting for the budget, building a better Ontario. And had she actually read the budget, she, Order. she seems to be referring to the additional 100,000 low-income seniors that will now qualify for the guaranteed annual income system. While we're at it, Mr. Speaker, let's think about a little bit of uh, the area that she represents, Scarborough. I hope she's going to support building the subway to Scarborough for the first time in 50 years. Awesome. Or the extension for the Shepherd East Line, Mr. Speaker. Or perhaps the health care in the hospital that we're building in Scarborough. And I feel like Colombo today because I almost forgot one thing. One thing. The medical school. Right in Scarborough, the first one. In 100 years, Mr. Speaker. While they talked about things for 15 years, we are getting things done right now. Order. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. 
The carbon tax continues to drive up the cost of living for all Ontarians, from filling our cars to heating our homes and feeding our families. Instead of addressing the inflation, the federal government wants to keep settling Ontarians with higher gas, energy and grocery bills. Speaker, Ontarians are having a tough time and they want to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But they are concerned that there is no end in sight for the carbon tax, as the federal Liberals plan to triple the tax by 2030. The federal Liberals, supported by the opposition NDP and the queen of carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, will continue to make life more expensive for everyone. That is unacceptable. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontarians cannot afford the NDP Liberal carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Speaker, I want to thank the great member from Markham uh, for that question. It, it made a lot of sense. And, and, and the previous question that we heard from the Liberal member from Scarborough Guildwood was actually a very fair question as well. And she was talking about the fact that it's difficult for people right now to afford paying their heating for paying for the price of the pumps, got the groceries are going up in price, Mr. Speaker. I can almost sense a little bit of a chasm forming in the teeny tiny Liberal caucus led by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, because the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is in full support of the federal carbon tax, which is driving up the price of gasoline and home heating and groceries, Mr. Speaker. Maybe this member is going to stand up to Bonnie Crombie and Justin Trudeau and talk about the issues that are facing Scarborough, because I'll tell you right now, her leader isn't doing Response. that, Mr. Speaker. And her leader just got wiped out in Milton and just got wiped out in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, Mr. Speaker. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. As my constituents become increasingly concerned about the stacking impacts of carbon tax, it is reassuring to hear that our government is looking out for the people of Ontario through affordable, affordable and reliable energy measures. But, Speaker, Ontarians deserve better. They deserve a federal government that works for them, not against and punishing them. Rising gas, heating and grocery costs are waiting on many households, and the last thing they need is another tax hike. The federal government must, go, must do the right thing now and the carbon tax and the suffering it is causing Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please explain what a real plan for building Ontario's clean energy advantage looks like? The member for Ottawa South is warned. The member for Orleans, come to order. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, we do have a plan for powering Ontario's growth. It's called Powering Ontario's Growth, Mr. Speaker. And we're investing in nuclear, and we're investing in hydroelectric, and we're investing in other non emitting resources, in the storage that we need, in biomass facilities to power our forestry sector in Northern Ontario. What does that plan not include? A carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. A carbon tax, which is driving up the price of everything in our province. And it's these liberal, quixotic, Points of view, unrealistic, unpragmatic views that have cost our province in the past and are continuing to cost our province now. It's just a different group. It's, you know, it used to be Kathleen Wynne and it used to be Dalton McGuinty bringing in the Green Energy Act. Now it's just Trudeau, supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, that's driving up the price of everything. In spite of that, our plan is working. Again, it's called powering Ontario's growth, and we're seeing multi-billion-dollar investments in our provinces. Member for Parkdale High Park has the next question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. My constituent Jane, an ODSB recipient, paid more than $1,000 for life-saving diabetes medication that Shoppers Drug Mart told her was not covered under Ontario Drug Benefit Plan. She submitted a claim to the ministry for reimbursement, but received over $100 less than her total payment. When my office inquired, the ministry said, 
pharmacies are allowed to charge more than the ODB listed price for cash paying customers. Why is the minister allowing this? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I'm happy to look into the individual example that the member opposite raised, but I want to reinforce and remind people that we have done a lot of work with pharmacists across Ontario to expand their scope of practice to make sure that people have access to treatment of those minor ailments that are so important. But specifically to your, your uh, constituents' concerns, I'm happy to take them away and do further investigation. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, predatory billing practices are becoming the new normal under this Conservative government's push to privatize health care. People like Jane are being forced to seek reimbursement for costs that should have already been covered and hope that Shoppers Drug Mart does the right thing and refunds the extra charges. Minister, will you crack down on Shoppers Drug Mart for trying to profit off of vulnerable people? Minister of Health. I'm not sure if the member heard my initial response, but I said I was happy to take away the individual example that you have raised with me and look further into it. I don't think that we can compare all of the 5,000 pharmacies that operate across Ontario with one specific example. I will look into it, and then we will have further conversations. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For those who have been in an automobile accident or know somebody who has been, they are well aware of the added stress dealing with an insurance company can cause. In 2020, this government undertook a consultation on eliminating the use of civil juries in Ontario because many felt civil jury trials were creating inconsistencies, delays, and unfairness to those involved in motor vehicle accidents, as well as to the average taxpayer. In over 95 per cent of car accident cases, it's the insurance company for the at-fault driver requesting a jury. Speaker, this system does not allow victims timely access to justice, and the Attorney General's office appears to understand this and went so, as, so far as to draft legislation in 2022 that hasn't made it to the floor of this House. Fast forward to 2024, and now the backlog of civil cases has grown to levels that are out of control. In some cases, jury trials are delayed until the end of 2025 or early 2026. Question. Speaker, through you to the Premier, what is the roadblock that is stalling a piece of legislation that would address the backlog and provide injured victims access to the justice they deserve? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, as the member opposite knows, and I thank her for the question, that we have been working very hard all even pre-pandemic, through the pandemic, and now post-pandemic, to make sure that the system is operating as well as it possibly can, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the modernization that we've, that we've done. Uh, we, we're bringing in a, a system, a backbone system, in cooperation with the Chief Justices at all three levels, the Ontario Court, the Superior Court, and the Court of Appeal, Mr. Speaker. We are adding resources uh, in FTEs. We're adding resources in terms of technology. Mr. Speaker, we're looking at all aspects, and this is one aspect that we're engaged in. Uh, we're talking to our partners at the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association. I was speaking with uh, the Ontario Bar Association just last week, Mr. Speaker, the Advocate Society, the Toronto Law Association. We're all engaged in making the system better, and this is one piece of the puzzle, Mr. Speaker. I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the response. As legislators, we should be making the lives of Ontarians less stressful and more affordable. I'm sure the consultation actually proved this, but nobody can seem to get their hands on it. In fact, there's an outstanding FOI request from 2022 from a lawyer in Thunder Bay. The FOI requested all of the submissions provided to the AG for and against the elimination of civil juries. The ministry has advised that this request was lost, then it was reassigned, then an extension was requested, and then it was re reassigned again. And as of today, 19 months later, 19 months after the request was filed, not one single record, file or submission has been received. I have the file number right here, if that helps get this uh, moving along. But we know developers have a foothold in the Premier's office, and I'm wondering who else might have undue influence. Speaker, again, through you to the Premier, who is instructing the Attorney General to sit on this important legislation that would clear the backlog and help accident victims? The Attorney General. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, the, mem the member opposite is right in the first part of her question, which is that we're all engaged in making the system work better. And she started off talking about the victims in the system, and that is a very important part of what we're doing. And it's not just in the Attorney General's office. Uh, it's you know the Minister of Community Social Services, uh, and and it spans about five different ministries, Mr. Speaker. And so we are doing a number of things to support victims. It's a it's a high priority for us, not just intimate partners, but whether it be car accidents, whether it be people that uh, find themselves in unfortunate situations. And so I'd be happy to talk about more of those supports, Mr. Speaker, but I do reject the second half of her question that there's some uh, malfeasance or some sort of uh, tomfoolery happening, Mr. Speaker. It's simply not true. We're working hard, we're working together, and we are making the system better, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Sir, my question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. The federal carbon tax is forcing Ontario families to stretch out their household budgets as housing affordability continues to be top of mind for Ontarians. The carbon tax is driving up the cost of building materials and the fuel prices to transport Shame. these materials to the building site. Shame. Speaker, this ludicrous tax is imposing more obstacles in housing construction, leaving more families waiting to achieve their dream of home ownership. While our government is standing up for Ontario families and addressing their housing needs, Bonnie Crombie's Liberals are standing up for the carbon tax. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please Question. explain how our government is continuing our progress in building the Ontario despite challenges from the carbon tax? The Associate Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Newmarket, Aurora. You know, Speaker, um, since 2018, we have averaged 20,000 starts more than the last 10 years of the former Liberal government. We know, though, there is so much more to do. That is why we, in we introduced Bill 185, cutting red tape to build more homes. That is why we reduced the HST on purpose-built rentals. That is why we've seen a 27 percent increase year over year, 23 to 22, and that is why we've seen more housing starts in the last three years than since the 1980s. <laughs> Speaker, building a house is an expensive proposition, and what is the number one component today that is hurting and punitively hurting the building of those homes? The carbon tax. What should we do? In the articulate words of the Minister of Energy, I ask the members opposite to talk to their friends in Ottawa and scrap the tax. <laughs> Supplementary question. Back to Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Yep, sure. It is unfair that the Liberal carbon tax is exasperating, exasperating the housing crisis by building up building costs, is driving up building costs for new housing. Speaker, when the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, was mayor of Mississauga, she built less than 40 per cent of the housing targets she promised to hit. And now she and her Liberals are propping up the costly carbon tax implemented by their Liberal buddies. It is clear that Bonnie Crombie's Liberals don't have Ontarians' best interests at heart, and Ontarians don't want Bonnie Crombie's broken housing promises. Our government continues to stand behind Question. the hardworking people of this province, and we will keep building for Ontarians looking for a home of their own. Speaker. Can the minister please explain how our government is building more homes faster across Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Tough but fair. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you for that intelligent, logical, and important question. You know, Speaker, I feel for everyone in Mississauga. My parents live there, my brothers and their families live there. And, you know, under Mayor Crombie, she had an abysmal housing record, as the member pointed out. In fact, Speaker, there was an 1,100-unit building housing unit that was proposed to be built. They wanted density. They wanted height. But it interfered with the mayor's thoughts. She didn't want her local bakery to be disturbed. Uh -oh. So what happens? We don't have these houses because of height and cookies and cake. It's sad. 
Shadows, cookies, and cake is why we don't build houses in Mississauga. Shameful. Speaker, here's the difference. We're getting the job done for Ontarians and the carbon tax. Think of what those 1,100 units would cost today with the added carbon tax. It's terrible. Response. Everything about housing is touched by the carbon tax. Speaker, scrap the tax. Next question, a member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Thousands in Toronto's West End rely on the Up Express for their daily commutes. Airport workers, families, and many others are stuck paying higher fares because Up Express riders don't get to benefit from the One Fare program. Can the minister tell us why Up Express riders and West End commuters have been excluded from One Fare, and will he commit today to including them? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, it's ironic to hear from NDP and Liberal about affordability, affordability for transportation, mm -hmm. Speaker, when this government under the leadership of Premier Ford brought forward one fare that eliminates the double fare and saves commuters $1,600, both NDP and Liberals voted against it, Mr. Speaker, not just once, they voted against Order. one fare twice, Mr. Speaker. Now one fare is a successful program. Over 5 million users used one fare right now, and they have benefited millions of dollars in saving, Mr. Speaker. We won't take lessons from parties who vote against affordability like one fare that saves $1,600 under the leadership of Premier Ford will continue to build transportation, will continue to increase the service, and will continue to put more money back into Spons. people's pocket. Thank you. And this supplementary question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. The 15,000 Pearson Airport workers, the thousands of commuters that use the Up Express, and the thousands of people who use the Up Express to get to Pearson to take a flight are not part of the one year fare program, and they desperately want to be. We are calling on the government to include the Order. Up Express in the one fare Order. program and increase service on the Up Express to meet demand. Can you do this, yes or no? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, when Liberals and NDP were in government, they built nothing, Mr. Speaker. They left people on crowded buses and trains, and they never eliminated the double fares, Mr. Speaker. When Premier Ford brought one fare, NDP and Liberal chose to vote against this twice, Mr. Speaker. Order. On this side of the House, we got one fare done, and Mr. Speaker, we are getting transportation built right across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, not just one fare. We are bringing back Northlander that NDPs and Liberals shut down 12 years ago, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to make sure we'll make life more affordable for transit riders in Ontario. Thank you. The next question. Order. The member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Small Business. Ontario's retail, retail and hospitality industries and are fundamental to the prosperity of my local community and to our economy. However, the costly carbon tax continues to impose challenges on small businesses that have a crucial role in our cultural heritage and economic success. The businesses, these important industries, add life to our main street many of which are cherished multi-generational family businesses. It is unfair that they are currently facing significant uncertainty as a result of the direct and indirect cost pressures from the federal carbon tax. Through you, Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell this House how our government is championing these vital businesses by standing up against the vital federal carbon tax? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the great member for Sarnia Lambton for his advocacy for all of the small businesses in his riding. Speaker, our government understands that small businesses on our main streets are economic drivers, but they're also a source of immense community pride. Local small businesses like Little Rose Cookie Company and Hobby Hobby in my riding of Mississauga Streetsville are some of the reasons why we have been unrelenting in our efforts to advocate for these businesses against the devastating impacts of the carbon tax. We've already taken concrete steps. 
When this government and this premier cut red tape and we lowered taxes, like the gas tax, how did the Liberals and the NDP vote? Oh, no. 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 Well, it's time to get on the right side of history and stand up for small businesses in all of our ridings. Speaker, I'm asking the federal government Spons. to scrap the carbon tax now. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that response. The Liberal carbon tax negatively impacts small businesses across all sectors, including the construction and trade sectors, which is vital to my community. It is hiking up the cost of their operations and transport. Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, <clears throat> has always stood shoulder to shoulder with the hard-working women and men in the skilled trades. We know we have the best workers in the world, and they work tirelessly to ensure businesses in Ontario continue to thrive and grow. I know the Associate Minister recently held a roundtable with representatives from small businesses within the skilled trades. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please tell the House what they had to say about the detrimental effects of this carbon tax on their operations? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the great member for the important question. Speaker, it's a shame to see carbon tax Crombie and the opposition Liberals here in this House supporting a disastrous policy that is making life more unaffordable for families and businesses across our province. Speaker, in London, I hosted a roundtable alongside Associate Minister Flack and representatives from the Construction and Skilled Trade Associations. The message was loud and clear. Construction and skilled trade businesses want to build affordable homes for Ontarians, but the carbon tax is driving up costs for operations, transportation, and forcing these companies to choose between cutting staff or increasing prices. So, Speaker, you can thank a Liberal the next time a young family in any of our ridings can't afford to buy a home. The opposition needs to call on their Boss. federal counterparts to scrap this disastrous tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A family in Tecumseh received a bill for $8,400 from the hospital because of Bill 7. Michelle Compo refused to accept the long-term care placement chosen by the hospital because it did not meet her mother's needs. Now the hospital says they will continue to be charged $400 a day. We warned that this would happen, Speaker. Patients, advocates and workers warned it would impact the most vulnerable people in our communities. My question is, why did this Conservative government ignore these warnings and continue to charge seniors and their families for care? To reply, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I want to be very clear. A hospital is not a home. Hospital leadership, yeah. hospital staff work very closely with patients and their families to match an appropriate um, alternative level of uh, a bed, and that in some cases means in community with home and community care support, and in some cases it means a long-term care placement. I want to reinforce as well that that individual actually continues to have their first choice there so that when there is an available bed at their first choice, they can have that option made available to them. But you know, we don't have the same level of uh, engagement in a hospital, in an acute care hospital, as we do in a long-term care home, which is exactly why we brought forward these changes. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. It is clear this government just does not care that patients are being charged hundreds or thousands of dollars. It was their legislation that's allowing it to happen. This particular case, when the daughter went to the home that the hospital was trying to send the mum to, not a home that was even in their top five choices, the keypad for the security code to get into the home was taped to the outside of the facility for anybody to be able to get in. Wow. Michelle wandered around that facility for 15 minutes before even spotting a staff member. The conditions were dirty. There were bugs. There were rodents. So respectfully, Minister, this is not about getting seniors into appropriate care. This is about pushing them out of hospital as fast as they can and placing an incredible financial 
burden on these families. Speaker, the government doesn't care about the immense pressure on families and caregivers. The Compo family said the stress and Question. financial burden that families are experiencing is exactly why this legislation needs to be revoked. Michelle said it's time to actually stand up and protect the elderly. So I'm asking the Premier, will you listen to patients and caregivers and immediately repeal Bill 7? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. And the response, parliamentary assistant and member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. And I'm so proud to rise today to answer my very first question as the parliamentary assistant to the wonderful Minister of Long-Term Care. <laughs> Speaker, as a result of Bill 7, nearly 20,000 patients have found a place to call home in long-term care. Of those, only 0.04% had a bill issued by a hospital to pay for post-discharge services. Speaker, on this side of the House, we trust doctors to know what is right for their patients when they medically clear them for discharge into long-term care, as was the case with this patient who was medically cleared many days ago. But don't take my word for it. Bill Mara, the CEO of Hotel Dear Grace Hospital, where the patient is staying, had this to say, and I quote, Bill 7 is an important legislation that is necessary to free up essential resources. As of Tuesday afternoon, there are at least two dozen people in Windsor Order. emergency rooms waiting for a bed. Speaker, that is two Spons. dozen patients that could be very, very sick, maybe even in life-threatening conditions like having a stroke or a heart attack or from a motor vehicle collision. I can tell you, Speaker. Member for Spadina, Fort York, come to order. That concludes our question period for today.